Dr. Hong Tang grew up in rural China and was encouraged by her pharmacist sister to become a physician. Both of her parents died from cancer, and they had avoided chemotherapy because they feared the side effects. As co-founder of On Quality, she's developing targeted cancer supportive therapy to address the root causes of oncology treatment side effects rather than just treating the symptoms. Oncologists are supported, and the more enlightened pharma companies understand the potential to improve adherence and outcomes. I'm David Williams, host of the Health Biz Podcast and president of Health Business Group, a strategy consulting firm that helps companies like OnQuality develop robust growth plans. Reach out to me, dwilliams at healthbusinessgroup.com if you'd like to discuss strategy for your company. And finally, please do me a favor and subscribe to the podcast. So, Dr. Hong Tang, CMO and co-founder of On Quality Pharmaceuticals, welcome to the Health Viz podcast. Yes, it's my pleasure. Thank you. We're going to talk about On Quality a little bit later, but first I want to hear the story about how you got to this point. Uh, in particular, I'd love to hear about your, your upbringing. Um, you know, where did you grow up? What, what was it like? Any big influences early on? Sure. Yeah, um, I grew up in rural China, actually. Uh, it was a very interesting time. You know, you know, China gone through quite a few stages of changes. Uh, and I had good memories of my childhood, even though we lived a, a very simple life. I grew up in a farm and my father was the head of the village. Um, his leadership and strategic thinking actually uh, impacted me uh, even though early on I didn't realize that. But later I can trace back a lot of the ways of my thinking and share similarity with his. I have three brothers and one sister, and I am the youngest of the five. Uh, when I was young, my mother was not in good health. I learned early on that I needed to live a life caring for others. Getting into medicine is a natural uh, outcome of these early influences. That's very interesting. And, you know, medicine uh, is one thing, and I think people know about being a doctor. Did you know early on about specializing and about whether oncology was something specifically of interest, or how did you? Yeah, um, early on, I, I don't think I really know what I wanted to be. Uh, when I was in high school, I really liked physics. I wanted to get into electronics. <laughs> so as I mentioned, my mother was not in good health. So I used to take care of her. And my sister was a pharmacist who advised me to get into medicine. So they, I eventually decided to study medicine. And how I get into oncology, you know, I, I am an internist by training. I'm board certified in the U.S. Uh, in internal medicine. I was initially working in drug development for infectious diseases. Later, I moved to oncology due to the fact that uh, both of my parents died of cancer. Both of them received surgery, um, but not uh, chemotherapy because of the concern of the severe side effects. Their experience prompted me to work in oncology and oncology supportive care. So how, how was the move from clinical care to um, moving into the pharmaceutical industry? Was that a, something that you had considered for, for a long while, or how did that come about? Yeah, I always like research. Even when I was practicing medicine, taking care of patients, I was involved in conducting clinical trials. Later, I decided to go full-time doing research. I joined the National Institute of Health, NIH, as a medical officer, there I oversee uh, various research programs, including clinical trials uh, in Bethesda, Maryland. I could have worked in NIH until I retire. However, I needed to move to New Jersey for the benefit of the family, which was a uh, catalyst for me to join pharmaceutical company. As you know, there are quite a few pharmaceutical companies in New Jersey. That makes sense. I actually grew up in Bethesda, so I went to school with a lot of people whose parents worked at the NIH. Uh, so that's a good, a good yeah, reason yeah. to be there. So I always like to hear a mention of, of Bethesda. Yeah. Now you, yeah, I love it there. Yeah, it's very nice there. It's a, it's a, it's a great place to yeah. grow up. Um, 
So talk about on quality and how it was that you decided to found the company. Yeah, um, I was fortunate to learn many aspects of medicine, as I mentioned, from clinical practice to clinical research, including doing all phases of clinical trials and medical affairs. And I had the luck to work in larger pharma, such as Bristol Myers Squibb, Astellas, and also biotech companies such as Human Genome Sciences, Juno, and Dendria. I'm always uh, inspired to be an entrepreneur. That's why early on I tried to establish a broad foundation for myself, like working as in uh, research and development, later uh, medical affairs. So it is a natural extension to become a founder of a startup company with my experience, background, and education. You mentioned uh, before your parents' um, you know, unfortunate experience with, with cancer uh, and that they hadn't had chemotherapy because uh, partly having to do with concern about side effects. Now, I noticed that on quality, what you're developing is, is, is targeted cancer supportive therapy. And I have a feeling that has something to do with being supportive of some of the challenging uh, treatments like chemotherapy. What, what, what does it mean, targeted cancer supportive therapy? Yeah, um, I just want to elaborate a little bit about our traditional approach to supportive care, tend to focus on alleviating the symptoms with non-specific approaches. For example, skin toxicities uh, from different and cancer therapy might be managed by using steroids. So they're not necessarily focused on what the reason causes the uh, uh, skin toxicity, but just any skin rash or any skin toxin being managed similarly. So our approach to cancer supportive care is different. We target the pathway that causes the side effects at a specific locations. So we are more specific to the cause and the location of the toxicity. So that's why the name targeted cancer supportive therapy were very focused uh, and targeted. So in this way, we could prevent the side effects without interfering the actual cancer treatment, not only improve the quality of life and perhaps improve the clinical outcome for the cancer patients. If we can help patients stay on cancer medications, uh, then you know we hope they can uh, have a better outcome. Now, targeted therapies is something that has been used in cancer for a while, but the idea of having targeted supportive therapies uh, sounds novel, and that's what you're. That sounds like it's what you're what you're bringing. What I'm curious though is that you know we think about how the technology is moving on, and we're getting toward precision medicine. Um, you know, is it the case that these cancer treatments that are going to be used in the future are going to be also, um, you know, causing severe side effects or would we be moving on to drugs that really don't have the side effects like the old style chemotherapies? Yeah, you know, we always hope the newer therapy will have less side effects. Eh? And in fact, they just have different side effects. You know, as you mentioned, chemotherapy side effects are much well known, such as low blood count, hair loss, or nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. However, the newer therapy also causes side effects. For example, the skin toxicities are uh, one of the most, uh, are the most common toxicity associated with target therapy. On the other hand, immunotherapy has immune uh, adverse events, which are very unique. They often, you know, sometimes could be uh, deadly. So uh, again, they're just different. We, and because of that, we need a more focused or targeted approach towards those side effects. Now, cancer, as, as I don't need to tell you, is uh, more than one disease, many, many different things that are going on there. And I'm assuming, therefore, that when you're targeting the, uh, uh, the side effects of the different treatments, you have to decide where you're focusing. And I'm wondering, you know, wh what are the areas that you're focusing on initially, and how did you choose those areas? Yeah, um, very good question. As I mentioned, uh, uh, earlier, skin toxicity is one of the most common side effects related to cancer therapy. So we are focusing on the skin toxicity uh, that uh, have no regulatory approval or treatment. So because of that, we select based on the MED need. Um, for example, we choose uh, VGF receptor inhibitors induce a hand foot skin reaction. And so our lead compound in clinical trial is addressing that uh, issue. And other uh, targeting, including EGF receptor 
inhibitor-induced skin rash or capsidabine-induced hand foot syndrome. All those have no uh, regulatory approved drug for it. And so that's where we uh, are focusing on. And those drugs are very commonly used for very common cancers, such as lung cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, kidney cancer, or thyroid cancer. So definitely, you know, there's a huge MED need out there. What is the development path like uh, for a supportive therapy? And how do you evaluate efficacy um, when you're developing a supportive therapy? Yeah. And- yeah. Yeah, interesting question. So we, we, you know, as I mentioned, we targeted the area where have no treatment. So we compare to placebo. We compare our uh, compound with placebo, and then look at uh, whether we could reduce the side effects um, compared to placebo while patients continue to take their anti-cancer medicine. Because that is our goal, is if they take their cancer medicine, maybe their clinical outcome would be better. But at the same time, we don't want them to suffer that much. So that's how we compare. We compare our compound versus placebo in reducing the severity of the uh, toxicity. And uh, how much of a factor is the patient's adherence to the the main therapy? Um, In other words, you're helping with the, the side effects, which presumably will help the patient, not just their ease, but the adherence perhaps to their medication, main medication for cancer, and maybe should help their outcome, assuming that that works well. Does that factor in or is yeah. that just a secondary concern? That factor in. Actually, we uh, one of the, um, uh, the, uh, the outcome we measure is how long patient can stay on their anti-cancer medicine. So we look at that and maybe even potentially look at some of the cancer outcome in the future. Now, the company, I think, has started in, in China, but has expanded to the U.S. What, what has that um, been like and how, how did you decide on the U.S. as the place to expand as opposed to, let's say, um, some other part of Asia or Europe? Yeah, and that could be because I am, you know, being in the United States and sure. we have our founder uh, in China, but it has been all along being positioned as a global company. And we feel medicine should not have border and the new medication should benefit as many patients as possible. So that's why we established the China US entity very uh, early on in very close uh, time frame. However, even this year, we also established our presence in Australia. And we want to take advantage of the uh, policy that Australia has uh, in encouraging clinical trials. So we, we definitely want to do some early clinical trials there. Yeah, I think it's interesting when you start a company that's already global uh, in its outlook. Uh, <laughs> it makes it uh, uh, makes for you know some good planning and uh, it gets more, more complicated at first, but I think is, is useful. So help me understand yes. that, help me understand kind of the, the commercial aspect of the business. So, you know, what is the business development like? Or do you work, how does a pharma company that's making a cancer treatment, how, how do they fit in to your plans? Are they just, are you working together or is it just two completely separate entities? What's the, what's the approach there? Well, you know, as a, our goal is to allow patients to stay on cancer therapy, right? Obviously, this would be a good way to partner with those companies who are making anti-cancer medications. And we want to generate the data. Then once we have the data, we may uh, initiate a conversation with those companies to see whether there, there is any collaboration and synergy. And are there any um, like what, are there any example companies that you can talk about that you'd be approaching, and or can you just say how how do those companies think about supportive therapies? Do they even think about them? Is it is it a negative to people when they hear that somebody you know might want a supportive therapy to go with them? Does it somehow make it seem like it's more toxic? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, you mentioned something very interesting because we do hear some companies say, well, if we don't talk about it, hopefully people don't know about it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, we do know some company, especially some immunotherapy company, they are actively seeking 
a company who can address the side effects. So, so I guess it's just different company have a different view on it. And, but once you have data, you, it's difficult to hide, right? Yeah. So if we have data say, hey, this drug causes this problem, now we can address it. So it's difficult to hide. So I, I we hope not all the company view that way. So we, we will yeah. see once we have the data. I think that, um, you know, looking a little bit further ahead, um, you know, if a supportive therapy is on the market, um, you know, for one drug compared to another, it should influence the prescribing uh, decision, especially if the oncologist wants to make sure the patient can stay on the on the therapy. So uh, I think it will work out well once you get there. I know there's a few hurdles to jump between now and then. Yes. Yeah, so we, with some oncologists, they are very much welcome any innovative uh, solutions in this field. I just know this because there's some amazing uh, medications out there, you, you know, for immune therapy uh, in particular. But if people can't stay on them, then then it won't get helped by them. So uh, this sounds great. Well, let me just ask you a final question about any reading uh, that you've had a chance to do uh, recently. Is any books that you would recommend or anything you recommend that we avoid? <laughs> yeah, I would say uh, recently I read a book by May Musk, Elon Musk's mother, yeah. uh, called A Woman Makes a Plan. I really enjoyed the reading because uh, her uh, uh, tenacity as a single mother raising three kids yeah. and also working as a supermodel and a dietitian. Even at the age of 71, her modern career is still flourishing. I think that's definitely it's a good example for, 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 for me, you know, to, to be persistent, to uh, keep on moving forward, right? And so, and I do feel her advice say you can, the, whatever the choice you make and the effort you put in can, pay off, can be paid off later on. I think that's it is very, very true. And if any book I really uh, would like to recommend, it, I, I really liked um, the tipping point, how little things can make a big difference. I read it many years ago, but it, even to this day, I feel still has an impact on me. The notion that you need to be passionate about what you do and be persistent to reach the tipping point to bring real change. I think that really resonates with me. Oh, that sounds terrific. Well, I appreciate those recommendations. Mm -hmm. And one reason I, I appreciate them is that we tend to get a lot of repeat recommendations here. And that's the first time I've heard uh, either one of those books recommended. So thank you for, for that. Oh, OK. Good to know that. <laughs> so more broadly, uh, Dr. Hong Tang, Chief Medical Officer and co-founder of On Quality Pharmaceuticals, thanks for spending time with me today on the Health Biz Podcast to talk about your personal journey and uh, the role of cancer supportive therapy in oncology treatment. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, really enjoyed the conversation. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.